Good evening, Facebook family um, and YouTube family as well. Welcome to another evening session with Ron and Janice. Uh, I thank you all for joining us today, and I hope everybody had a wonderful and blessed Thanksgiving holiday. We are so grateful and so blessed to be here today, and that every and we pray that everybody is safe. And those of you that had a chance and an opportunity to spend time with family, friends, and loved ones, and also to share, you know, give to some needy family or people out there that are in need at this time or any time that you were able to give someone with either your time, your talent, uh, financially, spiritually, encouragement, whatever you were able to do, I pray that you were able to make that happen. Um, we are just so grateful that you're here with us this evening. And one thing you know, we always want to share knowledge. In these times that we're facing right now, it is important like never before for you to read, for you to listen, share, get understanding, ask questions about anything that you're uncertain of with what's going on in the political arena, arena the government, whatever. Ask questions if you don't know research google we google everything so you can google anything you want i do want to share with you today a very interesting book that i am currently reading some of you may have already read it but it's why we can't wait by dr none other than dr martin luther king why we can't wait and brian is going to share some knowledge with us today in in light of this information, some of this information, and current information, current events, and past events. So at this time, I'd like for you to take notes if you need to, share this video with as many people as you can, uh, listen very intently, and don't hesitate to ask questions. We will get back with you with those answers. Thank you, and for now, I'm going to share, uh, turn the station over to Brian. Well, good evening, everyone. As Janice has said, we hope that everyone had a great Thanksgiving day. We want to continue to, before we go into our dialogue and discussion, we want to continue to encourage all teachers. Uh, we know that school is going to be back in session. On tomorrow. On tomorrow. So we just want to encourage the hearts of the teachers. Uh, we know that all teachers everywhere uh, is facing uh, some dire times. Yes, they are. The pandemic is seems to be escalating again mm -hmm. and there are more cases that are actually happening now uh, across the united states yes uh, more cases now than we've seen in times past yes uh and and even when the pandemic initially started so we want to encourage those hearts of teachers uh and and if i had to give them just a simple a word, I would tell them, I would remind them of Elisha when he had his young protege and student with him. Mm -hmm. And he went up on the mountain and Elisha prayed and asked God, told God to open the eyes, open the eyes. of my student that he may see yes. that we're not alone. Yes. And that's what I would say to the teachers. Uh, I would pray that God would open their eyes, that they may see that they're not alone. They're not alone. And that there are hundreds of thousands of chariots and angels uh, standing at their aid and standing beside them uh, to fight and aid and assist in this battle. Yes. So, and you have the prayers of many. So we just want to encourage everyone. We want to encourage uh, parents everywhere. We want to encourage people everywhere. Uh, we're in some some tough times. Yes, we are. Uh, but one thing is is assured is that God is still in control. Right? Yes, He is. So uh, we we're excited about that. Uh, even in living through these times, we are still a people that will prevail. We have done it all throughout all of history. Yes. <laughs> so there, there, this is no different uh, than any other case, and we will prevail in this situation as well. And we must remember, Brian, who we are. Absolutely. And whose we are. Absolutely. Because so many Absolutely. times we forget that. Absolutely. We forget that. So uh, Montgomery's going through some tough times right now and we wanna you know, encourage those people and we wanna pray yes. for those families. Yes. Um, and we're not gonna call any names, but we do wanna lift them up in prayer. 
-hmm. and we want you to pray for that fam those families in Montgomery that are that are mm -hmm. in Montgomery that have suffered a great loss due to the pandemic and just know that you're not alone. And, and for everyone that has suffered a loss. Right. Yeah. Everyone. It, 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 and be safe. Yes. People got to really be conscious and know that this thing is real. Absolutely. Wear your mask. Absolutely. Wash yes. your hands. Practice the protocols. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's get down to business. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As Janice, she, she uh, held up the book by Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, which is a phenomenal book. If you can, it's a great read. It's a simple read. Yes. Um, but we can't wait. We have just we gone through wait. a uh, an election uh, with Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and there are many questions that are still lingering as it relates to um, the the election process itself. What is actually going to happen? We see that Donald Trump is still filing lawsuits. Yes. Uh, and he has right. To do that uh, but we want to talk about this is not the first election that we have seen something like this this is not the first time this has happened um, I always say you can always go back in history and you can look at the same playbook that's been used now for 500 plus years yes okay and you can always pull out of that playbook instances and times that reflect the time that we are actually in right now and what we're dealing with right now and what we're going through right now as a people. So what I like to do is take it back in the time machine. We, we got to jump into the time <laughs> machine, uh, Facebook family, YouTube family. We got to go back and we got to look at an election that happened in 1876 that is very, very similar and shadows what's going on right now. Uh, this election was one of the most defining elections in the history of the United States and will always be considered as one of the most defining elections in the United States. And I'm going to tell you why. So we need to go back and understand what took place back then that is very similar to what's happening now. Okay, so let me go back and let's, let's paint this picture. Okay, okay after Johnson... Uh, is no longer president after Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. Uh, Johnson takes his spot. He does not run for a second term. Ulysses S. Grant, the Union war hero, is elected as president. He's elected for two terms, 1868 and 1872. Okay. During his elections or during his uh, administrations, particularly in the second term, there was a lot of scandal that went on mm -hmm. as it relates to the Grant administration. There were two significant scandals, okay? One is called the Credit Mobilia, and all of that was where it was when the uh, construction companies and finance companies were actually receiving contracts illegally, okay, and manipulating. The federal government was in on this under the Grant administration. And this, uh, the illegal manipulation of the contracts between the finance companies and the construction companies uh, helped to form what was back then known as the Union Pacific Railroad Company, exactly. which embezzled millions dollars. of dollars. That was one scandal. The second scandal was called the Whiskey Ring, mm. okay? And the Whiskey Ring was simply uh, whiskey distillers that were actually defrauding the government of federal taxes, okay? So they were not paying taxes. <laughs> Have we not heard that before? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this, this was going on within the actual grant administration mm -hmm. suite. So there were a lot of people at that time that were frustrated. Mm -hmm. They were angry. Um, during the Grant administration also, uh, we saw that the uh, actual price of gold dropped. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of things going on. Uh, we were in an economic depression also at this time. So I'm giving you that backdrop so that you'll understand it paves the way for what is going to happen in 1876. We know that Grant is elected up under the Republican Party. He follows 
Abraham Lincoln and Johnson. He's elected under the Republican Party. So the Republican Party was supposedly the party of, of uh, anti-slavery. It was the abolitionist party at the time. Uh, and not only that, we know that the Republican Party was also the so-called Reconstruction Party. So there were a lot of Southern states that were still angry mm -hmm. about what had happened as it relates to the Civil War and the South losing and now having to be reinitiated, if you will, back into the Union. So there was a lot of animosity going on between uh, the Republican and the Democratic parties at this okay. particular time. Pretty much like it is now. Just like it is now. Yeah. Okay. 1874, something happens that defines uh, a moment where the Democrats feel like we can now exert our authority. In 1874, the Democratic Party wins back the House of Representatives. And when they win back the House of Representatives, they begin from that point to push for a Democratic president. Okay. Now, keep in mind, the Democratic Party at that particular time was pro-slavery. Wow. And they were against Reconstruction. Okay. So they win back the House. They begin to push for a Democratic uh, president and a Democratic nominee. So from that point, the battle is on, so to speak. <laughs> okay. All right. We have two candidates on the floor. One of them is Samuel J. Tilden, who was a northerner. He was the governor of New York that is actually the Democratic candidate. So he was a Northern Democrat, a Northern Democrat that gets the nomination from the DNC, from the Democratic National Committee, okay? Rutherford B. Hayes was the Republican nominee. Now, let me give you two, some things just kind of to highlight both of these men. Something that was significant about um, Samuel J. Tilden is that he was very, very wealthy. Have we heard that before? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is he related <laughs> to Donald Trump? <laughs> very, very wealthy. Very, wealthy. very intelligent. Mm -hmm. um, went to New York University. Uh, there was a couple of colleges that he actually went to. Like I said, he was state governor, came from a wealthy family. Um, you know, served as the 25th, 25th governor of New York. So he, he had a good reputation. Some of the things also that was interesting about Tilden that a lot of times is not pointed out in history, uh, but the Republican Party at that time began to highlight some of his personal issues. And one personal thing that they began to point out is that he was not married. And that Samuel J. Tilden also, uh, they began to point out that at that particular time, which is a big stigma, that he was possibly a person that um, engaged in uh, homosexuality or that he was gay. Okay. So why did they do that? They did that <clears throat> as a propaganda campaign against him because they did not want to see him elected as president of the United States. Okay. But Samuel J. Tilden, uh, just by when you look at his record, a very, like I said, intellectual, mm -hmm. uh, had it together, governor of New York. Uh, he was the man that was going to change the landscape of what was going on with the Grant administration. Okay. So now some of the things that he runs on is civil reform. Okay. And he runs on the gold standard coming back, which civil reform was simply uh, the reformation of jobs, federal jobs. Okay. Now, what we have to remember is, is that during Reconstruction, the federal jobs opened up to African American people, enslaved, former enslaved people. Okay. So what is civil reform? It was simply them restructuring how civil service jobs okay. would be actually given out to those who were actually enslaved people mm -hmm. and those who served in the Civil War, 
be it whether or not it was a soldier or a family member. So he was one that supported, that was part of his, <clears throat> excuse me, his platform okay. was civil reform. Also, he was part, he, his platform consisted of supporting going back to a gold standard backing the dollar. During the Abraham Lincoln administration, because of the war, the funds of the government fell low and Abraham Lincoln puts into law the greenback law where the printing of money okay. Okay, uh -huh. came into play to fund the government through the war because the war was bankrupting the government. Wow. So the gold standard initially prior to the greenback movement, and also let me mention this, Peter Coppin at the, at the time also ran in 1876 under the greenback party. And his platform was to keep the greenback in place and not go back to the gold standard where gold would back the dollar. Okay, so that's just to give you a little history there on Samuel J. Tilden. Now, when we look at Rutherford B. Hayes, very interesting character, very, uh, came from a, a family that was not as well to do as Samuel J. Tilden. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also a governor, he was governor of Ohio. Okay, but the interesting thing about Hayes initially being the Republican nominee is that he was anti-slavery. He was a abolitionist attorney. So he fought for, on some cases, for the abolishment of slavery concerning uh, Southern slaves. Wow. Okay, so that was very interesting within itself uh, as it relates to Rutherford B. Hayes initially with how he starts out, <laughs> okay? A lot of times how you start out is not how you end, right? Right. <laughs> okay, but he starts out that way. Here's the conflict with Rutherford B. Hayes. While he was an attorney yes. that was uh, anti-slavery, mm -hmm. he was also at the same time sympathetic to the South. Wow. And what had happened as it relates to them not only losing power, but also losing their political uh, power as it relates to the North, the Union, actually going in and stripping them of seats wow. politically, uh, you know, making it to where African Americans were elected to the Senate at this time in mass numbers. Wow. After so he was sympathetic to the shift of power that had happened in the South. Okay. So now let's fast forward. Uh, November of 1876. They have the election. Samuel J. Tilden, well, let me not say when, but has 184 out of 185 electoral votes. Rutherford B. Hayes only has 165. The popular vote, Samuel J. Tilden, has 4,300,000 votes. Rutherford B. Hayes have a little bit over 4 million. So not only does Samuel J. Tilden win the popular vote by 300,000, he also is one vote from winning all of the electorate votes, <laughs> which at that time was only 185 electorate votes. He had 184 to 165. So by right, at that time, he should have been the president hands down. Right. Okay. What happens in that case is the Congress decide, okay, since you, you're one vote away, we're going to establish a commission, an electoral commission. There were three states, sweetheart, that actually uh, in the South that still had 19 electoral votes that were hanging in the ballots and that were not counted at this time. Okay, those three states were, can you guess? Alabama probably was. No, Alabama was. <laughs> no, it was uh, Ohio. Was no. 
Southern states. Southern states. Uh -huh. Georgia. No. <laughs> so, no, so you, I'm not going to guess <laughs> anymore. I'm done. <laughs> I don't know. Who okay, was? so it was Florida. Florida. Uh, Louisiana. And you got to help me on this last one now. What, uh, Texas? No, 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 no. My memory is gone. Let me, let me think for a second here. Uh, Facebook, baby, just give me one second to think about <laughs> this. Uh, so it was uh, South Carolina. Carolina. Okay. So everything happened in South Carolina. Everything. So we have to remember that. <laughs> so it was South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida that still had 19 electoral votes that were held out. Okay. So now what each party does, the Republican National Party at the time, the RNC, mm -hmm. and the DNC, both put lawyers, a team of lawyers together, and a team of observers to go and to try to sway the 19 electorates as it relates to those electoral votes or those delegates as it relates to those 19 electoral votes. <laughs> now, he, he, this is the interesting thing is because history records that <clears throat> Hayes's uh, an, an attorney on Hayes' sides actually takes about ten thousand dollars with him. To so in the swaying of these political electoral votes, a little bit of money is being exchanged. Okay, I'm <laughs> sure that didn't make a okay. difference. Did so it? <laughs> now, also, what what is powerful about this as well is the Supreme Court is also in, involved in the process of these 19 electoral votes being selected. So let's, let's keep moving in our time machine, okay? <laughs> March the 2nd, the case is finally, here's three months later, the election is finally decided. Wow. Three months later, March 2nd, the Supreme Court announces that Rutherford B. Hayes, okay, let me back up. What they do is they call Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden together. They call them in the same room with the Southern Democratic House that who had taken, who had taken control of the House of Representatives in 1874. They call all of them together and they say, this is what we're going to do. Wow. Okay. They tell Rutherford B. Hayes that we would agree with the vote count as it relates to you being the president-elect, but you have to give us something. Now, here's the 18, what you know in history as the 1877 compromise. Mm -hmm. They said, you've got to do something for us. We know that you are sympathetic to the plight of what has happened down south. What we want is the military to be pulled out of all of the southern states. So wherever the Union is still enforcing certain laws, still enforcing uh, different things as it relates to uh, land grants, concerning black colleges. See, a lot was going on at this time, okay? We want you to pull back the federal military wow. and we want power in our states again, full power. Wow. We will establish our own military. Mm -hmm. So now you see at this time, so now the rights fall back to the authority, fall back to the governor, fall back to the state, military or what we would consider now as reserves, yes. state reserve units, mm -hmm. Air National Guards of Alabama, Air National Guard of Florida, so on and so forth. Okay. So they pull out the military, the federal government does. And when they do that, reconstruction comes to an end. Wow. Okay, so now when Reconstruction comes to an end, everything that was being done and enforced by way of the military, making sure that these formerly enslaved people were treated fairly, that protection is gone. Wow. 
Okay. Not only does that happen, at the same time, the Freedmen's Bureau mm -hmm. and all of the banks, mm -hmm. remember the scandal that I told you about that Grant had going on with the, the Pacific Railroad. Well, the black banks, okay, that was established by the Freedmen's Bureau, the CEOs and the bank boards were made up by the same men that were actually participating in the illegal contracts, the money embezzlement, and so the Freedman banks go broke because they take all of the money out to try to subsidize for money they were losing with making bad stocks and bond deals. <laughs> okay, so now here are black people left with no land, left with no protection, and the monies that they had put in those banks are now gone. They're dissipated. Wow. Rutherford B. Hayes gets the 19 votes and one from Oregon, and he wins the presidency 185 to 184 as far as electoral votes based on the compromise that they make in the back room. So that's where we get the terminology, backroom deals. Backroom deals are being made all the time. What we are seeing right now with Trump hiring attorneys, all right, we saw Pennsylvania, was it? Yes. Just come out and declare yeah. Trump as the uh, rightful winner. He won those votes. He won those electoral votes. Yes, he did. Electoral okay. votes, he did. So that's why you see now Trump calling. For he said, I want the electoral college. Why is he saying that? It is the same playbook that happened with Rutherford B. Hayes and Tilden. and Tilden, where they had to call for a commission mm. to make the final decision on who would become president. Now, if this thing run past January, we shouldn't be surprised because this ran three months with Tilden and, and Hayes. Hayes. Yes. Okay. So that's why Trump is now saying, and I heard him say this the other day, that I want the electoral college votes to, and, and, and I want the electoral college to say that I am not president or that I did not have more electorate votes in these states that I won. Yes. Then Biden. That's why he is pushing for that. That's exactly that is also why he is pushing for the Supreme Court. Supreme Court got involved in 1876 as well. It is the same game yeah. out of the same playbook. Yeah. Nothing is different, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing. Okay? We're looking at the same <laughs> tricks. We're looking at the same. And now, this is the thing, and it's very interesting because Trump Advisors know this. They understand this. They know the history. They, they, they understand the history. They understand that they can go to the 12th Amendment. They understand all of this yes. to where they can push to get elect the electorate involved yeah. by way of declaring yeah. that Trump won more states and had more votes, electoral votes, and that those states that were in question need to be retabulated. That's wow. why he was pushing for the recount. So I want everybody to understand what's going on. Yes. Like I said, we have to be this. We can't wait. We, we have got to, we cannot be silent. We have got to continue to voice our opinion. We have got to continue to uh, not only voice our opinion, we need to make phone calls. Yes. to our congressmen, to our senators. We need to be vigilant in making sure that we determine what we get and we determine our own destiny. Do not leave it in the hands of a crooked government. And that's the same thing. We're dealing with the same thing, same today, thing today that we dealt with 
that they dealt with back then. Nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. African people are the ones that are always hurt. Yes. So with the 1877 compromise, it rolled back the clock for African people a hundred years. So we're looking at the same dilemma today. We're facing the same dilemma today. So we have to be vigilant. That's why I say, even if Biden and Harris truly are put in office and sworn in, and I do believe they are going to be. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. I, I don't believe that some of the shenanigans that Trump is trying to pull is going to ultimately win. I don't believe that. I, I do believe that Biden and Harris are going to be inaugurated as president and vice president. But we have to continue to demand that this is what we want. We do not need to allow, like what happened in 1877 for reparations, to be rolled back because that's what happened. That's what happened. Their form of reparations as it relates to reconstruction, as it relates to the slave having the same opportunities, the same civil rights, the same human rights, which we discussed. Yes. There's a difference yes. between human rights and, and civil, civil rights. rights. Your human right is your right to exist and to be free just like any other person in this earth. So we need to stay on the battlefield yes. as it relates to that. And we need to demand from Biden and Harris, okay, the bill has come due. Yeah. What are you all going to do? Are you going to placate to all of the pundits or are you going to live by your promises? And we have to make certain, and when I say we, black people, to not be tricked into thinking that they are going to do anything for us that is going to be advantageous for us. We have to make certain yes. that we demand, we demand, we demand. That means if we have to reorganize to go not only to march, but if we have to do sleep-ins, Okay. Whatever, whatever it takes, <laughs> we have to become radical to the point yes. to where we get something out of this deal. Mm. Okay. So now we've heard all the words. We've heard all the promises. Well, didn't yeah. Biden did say thank you but, well, to African Americans? Yeah. He did. But, he but said the, that. But words are just words. Mm. Words don't mean a thing when you don't put action behind it. That is true. Okay, so enough of words. We didn't heard that before. You know, it was Bill Clinton that says uh, that black people don't demand anything. He said, as long as you can erect a monument and uh, do commemoratory speeches for them, they're fine. They don't want anything. That, that was the so-called what black people considered the first black president. That's what he said. Okay. Wow. So now we have to, and he was right. He was. I cannot argue with him. All we want is a plaque put up, civil rights monument put up. We want a speech to come. We want, you know, the, the president to come. And we'd say we took a photo op with the president <laughs> or the senator and, and us dancing, prancing the streets. And that's it. A time out for that. Mm. That's not getting us anywhere. Nowhere. Okay. So. We need to tell Biden, you need to put your money where your mouth is. This is about now demanding mm -hmm. that something be done. See, what happened with Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden is the Democrats said, if we let you have this election, you got to put your money where your mouth is. And your money where your mouth is, what does he do? Reconstruction comes to an end. He returns power to the South. Now all of the black senators that were once elected oh, in no. Reconstruction oh, are no. gone. Oh. Guess what? All of the monetary power and the economic power of the South returns back to the South. The South lifts themselves out of an economic depression and now within the next two elections become again a force as it relates to economics and driving the country 
when it comes to import, exporting, and trading. Okay, so what they demanded from him was, is our right, and this is what they said to him when during the deal, they said to us that the Republic was meant for us as citizens, and your job under the Constitution is to re protect the Republic and to re protect the Republic citizens. We are the citizens of the Republic. You have wronged us, even though slavery was wrong. The Democrats stated that you have wronged us as citizens of the Republic. So they put some demands in place. Look, you get nothing if you demand nothing. And I think it was Frederick Douglass that talks about the demand. We have to demand something. And we have to be willing to fight and die for that. See, what Rutherford B. Hayes understood, if he did not give these Southern Democrats who now had power in the House what they wanted, he was looking at another civil war. Wow. Which would have, in my opinion, been the undoing of the United States of America as we know it and possibly would have fallen back up under European control, i.e. Great Britain. They would have taken full advantage of another civil war happening. So Rutherford B. Hayes understood that now is not the time for me to play with the country in the establishment of the country. So when they put those demands in place, they were willing to fight. They literally, they said, you are going to meet these demands. You're going to give us what we're asking. We are citizens of the Republic and we are do this. And if you can't do this, then we're willing to fight. We have to be the same way. If Biden gets in there and starts backtrotting on his words, and if Kamala gets in there, even though she's an AKA, you know, you understand? What I'm Sorry about that, Brenda. Shout, shout, out to, <laughs> shout out to the AKAs, okay? Even though she's an AKA That's and okay. she's a Howard grad and all of this other stuff, if she gets in there and does nothing for black people, then we need to hold her accountable. It is just that simple. See, we can't get caught. One thing I love about history is, is you see the mind of how people think. One thing when it comes to European people, they don't get confused and emotional, whereas concerning them advancing and their interest. They stick See, with we, that. We get confused. We get all emotional. We so happy. Oh, woman of color in office. And oh, Biden, who's still one of the most vile racists in, <laughs> in right now, still in the administration, in Congress, in Senate, he has always been, he still is. Leopard doesn't change his spots. They get bigger as they get older. That's exactly right. Okay, so what I'm saying is, regardless of all of that, okay? Yes. He's in there, let's hold him accountable. We had some stake in the game, we had some skin in the game, uh, because like Stacey Abrams and all of the rest of the leaders yes. that got out there and hustled and grind to make sure that African-American votes were counted to and to make mm -hmm. sure that people got to the polls, yes. we have to hustle and grind and hold their feet to the fire as it relates to what we need to see happen in our community. There needs to be economic reform in our community. There needs to be educational reform. We need health care reform. All of those things must happen. We have to do that. Okay? So uh, I'm going to end there. <laughs> okay? just, give, just giving you a historical <laughs> backdrop. Uh, but but, uh, but brothers Ryan, and sisters. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. where, where do we go from here? Where are we? You know, we see where we are. You know, we're excited, mm -hmm. but things are dwindling a little bit now because of some uncertain 
uncertainties out there. But mm -hmm. right now, where do we go as African American people? Where do we go from now? What can we do? You said we gotta fight. We gotta get up, mm -hmm. pick up the phones. We got the call. But we have to be keep our eyes open and that third eye that mm -hmm. spirit we got to be in tune mm -hmm. with what's going on mm -hmm. a lot of us if it's not on our phone mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> we, we don't we don't we don't want to know we, we don't read but a lot of us are watching the news but we got to understand that the news gives you each 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 news feed gives you their view yeah their opinion and and it is it's propaganda it's all propaganda but I mean, you you're asking the question that everyone asks: Where do black people, as a unit, I believe that black people have to solidify. <clears throat> we have to unify ourselves, and we cannot allow our differences to divide us anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I mean by that? It doesn't matter whether or not you are Republican or Democrat if you are black. You are in the same boat. By your skin, you're yes. in the same boat. Yes. You, you understand what I'm saying? We have to unify with one voice. And if necessary, I keep saying this, we have to establish, if it comes to this, our own party, and then start voting right. in a block for the representative that actually will take our interest to the table. We need a seat at the table. Black people still don't have a seat at the table. Even though we have elected senators, we have ele elected congressmen and congresswomen, we still don't have a voice at the table. They do not represent the majority of black people. They do not speak for the majority of black people. We need somebody that will speak for our interests, somebody that is not afraid, that will stand up and say no. The majority of black people are still being left behind, and yes. this is why. Okay? We we cannot talk about pulling themselves up with their bootstraps when they don't have any boots on. We need to put something in place to put some boots on their feet. Then we could talk about them having bootstraps. But until we get to that place, so black people, if that's why I said. If we, if the demands that we make are not met, then we need to be able to organize, unify around establishing a separate party. And it's not difficult to do, establishing a separate party. And then our vote definitely can put who we want in office. Yes. It can elect yes. senators and congressmen yes. that will represent our yes. interest. Well, didn't the okay. black uh, the Black Panther Party do that? They, yes, that's Black, what black Panther do. Party yeah. was doing that. Yes. That's why it was sabotaged by the CIA and the FBI. Okay, that's why the United States government went in, put a mole in place, and killed the leaders. Okay, so the Fred Hamptons. That's why he was murdered. It was not so much, and this, you're talking about a young 22-year-old man that wielded power because he understood how to organize black people around a common cause, and that is putting food on the table of our children, yes. making sure that they had uh, affordable drug care by making sure that yes. drug stores were in the neighborhood. Yes, grocery yep. stores. Making sure that the kids yes. had a good meal yes. before school putting things in place that represented the interests of black people, that empowered black people, okay? So we have to go back, we have to look at what Fred Hampton, those original organizers of the Black Panther Party, we have to look at the original organizers of SCLC and look at the models that were put in place of Urban League and all of those other things. Now, I would even say the NAACP, even though it was founded by nine white people were the original founders wow. of the NAACP, <laughs> and majority of them were Jewish people. So most people don't know that the NAACP was put in place based on Jews being mistreated in the United States, not based on colored folks being mistreated. 
So the premise of that was, is that the Jew cannot be treated any less than the colored. So if we put an organization in place to represent the colored, which is supposed to be the lowest in this society, then it automatically benefits the Jew yeah. because we're not lower than them. Mm. Okay, so the financial backing, the concept, all of that came via the mind of a Jew. Now we know W.E. Du Bois and the Niagara Commission, yeah. we know that that was the groundwork, but because the blacks that met could not come to a consensus agreement, it now fell to Jews to take up the banner. Wow. So what that shows me <laughs> is, and, and this is what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, we for some reason cannot get it together when it comes to working with each other without being jealous, without one turning on the other. Wow. wow. When that commission met and W.E. Du Bois met, one of the, and I forget his name, Walter, it, it'll come to me. Uh, his first name was Walter, but he was a preacher. Disagreed with some of the things in the formation of what is now known as the NAACP mm. with Du Bois. And that's what killed the whole movement. We have always had a problem when it comes to organizing, putting our differences aside, and saying we're doing this for the whole. For the masses. The majority. All, yes. That's right. Let's put yes. our petty interests yes. aside. Interests aside. And let's do this for the majority. Of our people. Yes. And our children. You fit grandchildren. into that. That's exactly okay. Right. We fit into that. Wow. So it's not about how much success. Mm. It's not about how we have uh, navigated ourselves through the system. We have to understand that we cannot be so selfish that we, and I say this all the time yes, in every do. show, yes. that we do not think about the interests of the people. people. So, and that's what Du Bois was arguing. This needs to be about the majority of the people. And the majority of the people are not in a condition to where they have a voice. And we See? got so many churches out so here we, and so many platforms, and they cannot come together and bring a group of people together for mm -hmm. one common cause well, that's for because the masses. The, that's because churches are different now. Churches do not gather in order to liberate their people anymore. Wow. They gather to entertain their people now. See, and that's different. So the platform has changed. But they so used to they, be. At one time, yes. churches gathered to liberate, to organize and liberate their people. people. Now, like the churches gather to entertain. Woo. So we need to understand. We can't look. There are a few conscious pastors. Now, I'm not saying all churches. I understand. I'm saying the majority of churches. <laughs> 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 There's a difference. But we have to recognize that. And we have to step out as a people. And if the church don't take the lead, we have to take the lead as the normal person, see? Okay, so the church could be doing fine. It's got his million dollar edifice. You know, the pastor's got his Cadillac and his big mansion on the hill, but the little man in there that's paying tithe doesn't have a voice, okay? So it may be the little man now that needs to step out and say, hold up, something's wrong here. Wow. We've got to do this for ourselves if nobody will step up and do it for us. And we got to be willing to organize. We can't be uh, so selfish, like I said, that we do not consider everybody being at the table. Okay, so we'll we'll end with that. Yeah, I thank you for that, Brian. I do know that you are you are truly a fighter, and you are one for the people. You care about the little man. I, I've seen mm -hmm. that from day one when I met you. You truly, truly care about the underserved. And that's what, you know, we do, and I've been guilty of this, you know, we get out, go off to our Ivy League colleges or our predominantly white colleges or whatever, our HBCUs, and we get our education and we look at it like, hey, I got mine, I ain't worried mm -hmm. about it. They need to get theirs. It was just as hard for me to get mine. If I can do it, anybody can do it, but it's not just that simple. And I've learned that. I know that we all have a mindset that we can obtain what it is we need in life to substantiate ourselves and our families. 
But in the end of it, there may be some sisters and brothers out there that just can't get it together. And all they need is a chance. They just need that one force, that one somebody to say, hey, let me show you how this process works. Let me help you. And we need to start with our young people. We need to start with the kids in high school. You do not have, and right now I know it's not a good time, but there, there will come a time that we can invite ourselves into these classrooms with these high school kids and middle school kids and just share knowledge. Let me, and let me say this. Uh, Frederick Douglass said this about the Negro. He said that you take the slave that's in the field on the plantation and he said another master would come and visit the plantation where the field Negro was and he would bring some of his slaves with him. Okay, They would be preparing for what they call a hoedown on Friday nights. So they would bring some of the slaves that would accompany the master visiting the other plantation would be dancers and mm. fiddlers, would be entertainers. Yes. But prior to the entertainment, the slaves would get together in the field and they would argue with each other about which one of their masters treated them the best, which one of their masters had the most money, which one of their masters beat them less. And they would say, me got a good master. My master don't beat me with 30 stripes. He only beats me with 15 stripes. My master's better than your master. Well, that shows you the level of mental uh, just brainwashing that we have gone through. See, today we get in the same arguments. My job better than your job. And my, my principal don't teach, don't, don't do the things that your principal do. Uh, I make more money on my plantation than you make, but my master pay, <laughs> see, we, we, we do the <laughs> same types of things today. Yeah. You understand what I'm yeah. saying? My house bigger than your house. I got a nicer car. My master let me have this car for $60,000. And then you get fired the next week and can't pay for the $60,000 car and the repo <laughs> man comes in. And, but, but it goes to show you the level yeah. of brainwashing. Yeah. So what, what I'm saying is, it doesn't matter what master doing what. And this is what Fred, Frederick Douglass in his conclusion, he said what the slave has to realize is, is that they're still on the plantation and no treatment on a plantation is better than any other regardless of how good you think your master is. You understand? So we have to look at that. So when we start looking at our brothers or sisters that doesn't have as much, that may not be as educated, we can't think just because we got an education that we're any better off than they are because they don't have an education and that their plantation is a little bit harsher than ours. No. Okay, so what, so... We are still in this fight together. That's what Frederick, Frederick Douglass was saying. Look, doesn't matter. We're all in this together. Okay? Your master, fine. May have more money, fine. May, may beat you less, fine. But you're still on the plantation. You're still not free. That's the thing. <laughs> you're still not, not free. free. This is about the liberation of us all. Okay? So on that note, I'll end. Yes, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us. And yeah. uh, this was awesome. It was powerful. And I'm going to share it on uh, my Facebook page. And we will download it to um, YouTube as well. And our YouTube site is Men and Women of Destiny. Mm -hmm. Men and Women of Destiny. And subscribe. Subscribe. Like. Like, you know, yes. we just want those likes. We just want you to share. We want to empower us, each other, with so much knowledge, you know, and, and to liberate us all, mm -hmm. liberate us all, and let us just become one. Just one. Because we are one. Believe Absolutely. it or not, we are, we are one. Yeah. Um, so, 
you know, I love you guys. Brian and I love you guys. Brian studies endlessly to um, educate and to empower us, all of us, me, you know, um, I'm trying, I, I'm getting there. I, I want to know more. I desire to know more. And uh, I thank God that he is placing me in front of this mm -hmm. man, venue. this well, venue yeah, yeah, that yeah. I can learn. Yeah. And I can just flip back and watch any of these sessions that I want to want to watch and that I need to learn more from. And it's available for all of you. I don't share them all, uh, I, but they're still on my page. And uh, you can go and look at any of them. We've been doing these since May. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Right. So please, you know, you can learn so much. And we just want everybody to be enlightened and to be educated and to know we all have rights here. We're just not standing up. We're right. not standing up. And so we'll end on this yes. note. Uh, information translates to knowledge. Knowledge translates to power. Don't be one that just get information. What makes information translate to knowledge is when you apply the information that you get. Yeah. When you apply the information that you get, it turns into knowledge. Yeah. And then that knowledge becomes powerful because you can use it for your interest. Okay? Thank you, Brian. All righty. <laughs> We love you guys. Bye -bye. Thank we you. Love you all. Have a beautiful, blessed, and safe week. We'll see you next Sunday at same time, 6:30. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.